All right. <laughs> Hello, folks, and welcome to Cindy's webinar. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll just start um, by saying, um, in, in the spirit of meaningful reconciliation, we're proud to acknowledge our presence on the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people in what is today Nova Scotia. The Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1725 and subsequent treaties remain foundational to the relationship between the Mi'kmaq people and all Canadians. And we are all treaty people. Um, this uh, workshop it is um, part of the Common Ground Project, which is a, a collaboration between Community Forest International, Olnawag Development Group, and the Family Forest Network. And it's the aim is to mobilize citizen climate action in the rural maritime region on the unceded territory of Mi'kmaq and Wallastuig uh, peoples. Um, so over 80,000 uh, rural forest stewards in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, uh, Prince Edward Island uh, collectively manage over 4.2 million hectares of, um, Acad of, of Wabanaki Acadian forest, which is the forest uh, type that we have in this region. Uh, and it's cri a critically endangered forest type. Uh, and together we believe that these citizen forest stewards can achieve globally significant greenhouse gas uh, reductions and locally significant climate adaptation outcomes. So drawing on both indigenous forest knowledge and climate smart forest management, we aim to build a community for climate smart forestry, learning from key experts and creating shared knowledge and storytelling between uh, uh, between communities. So by focusing on our, our common ground, as, as the project is named, uh, the project um, will amplify um, Indigenous rights, relationships, and opportunities as they relate to the region's forests. And the aim is to strengthen understanding and allyship between Indigenous and settler forestry uh, practitioners around issues of forest care and climate action and to diversify approaches to climate action in the private forest sector, which is currently dominated by settler knowledge and perspectives. So led by Al Nueg, uh, one of the partners in this, the, the Common Ground Partnership uh, seeks to share Indigenous experience and knowledge of the land, furthering holistic and ecosystem-based perspectives within forestry and forest communities. Uh, and all of this work is supported by the Canadian Climate Action and Awareness Fund, the Catherine Donnelly Foundation, RBC Foundation, New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund, and the Chalkers Foundation. So moving on to our star of tonight, uh, Dr. Cindy Stacer has been conducting research on forest birds in Nova Scotia for over 25 years. She retired from the biology department at Dalhousie University in 2019 after developing its seaside field course program, leading its integrated science program and teaching numerous courses in ecology and biodiversity. In fact, she is currently co-teaching at Dalhousie Species at Risk field course, which she developed and is taking students on a week-long field trip next week. Over the years, Cindy has trained many students, interns and volunteers and has led several research monitoring and stewardship projects. Work by Cindy and her students laid the foundation for the forest bird monitoring program at Kejimkujik National Park and Historic Site. Other projects identified bird species sensitive to forest disturbance and how they are impacted by narrow riparian buffers. More recently, she and her students have been characterizing the habitat needs of forest birds that are listed species at risk. Cindy and her team are now focusing on stewarding these habitats in the working forests of Nova Scotia. Tonight, she will be sharing her knowledge about the habitat needs of our forest birds and describing her latest project, which is a collaboration with forest practitioners to develop and test beneficial management practices for land bird species at risk in working forests. And for um, anyone that joined after our initial introduction, um, we have you on mute for now, but if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll get to them when um, Cindy's done her presentation. And you can also use the raise hand function at the end of the presentation to ask, uh, to be unmuted to ask a question. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Cindy. Thank you, Christy. I just have one question for you. Uh, will I have to let participants in or can you see? I can them? let them in. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. Oops. 
Um, sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. I was uh, checking out the AB before and I was stuck in the middle of my presentation. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about a project on land birds at risk in working forests and uh, trying to conserve the SAR through beneficial management practices. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about tonight is I'll first give you an introduction to the project and the focal species. I'll say a little bit about migratory bird guidelines, um, and then we'll focus on beneficial management practices. Um, then I will um, go through each species individually, um, briefly tell you how to identify them, um, what, their, uh, what the characteristics of their breeding habitat are, and um, examples from the draft BMPs that have been produced just recently and that we're using um, as a, as in this pilot project. Um, uh, I will also be giving an update. Um, I, I gave a, sim a similar talk uh, a little over a year ago. So I'll, I'll be updating with uh, what we did in 2021 in terms of our surveys and analyses and what we're doing now in 2022. So the main goal of the project is to find solutions that will benefit both the birds and forestry. And we're doing this by developing and testing in a collaborative and iterative process, a set of operational guidelines for best management practices for five land bird species at risk in Nova Scotia. And this is one of them here, the olive-sided flycatcher. It has turned out to be uh, the most common of the, of the five SAR that we have found in the harvest blocks that um, are going to be undergoing the BMP applications. But more about that later. Uh, so these are the five um, land bird species. They, are, they show strong site fidelity. They come back to the same site year after year. And uh, so therefore recovery of their populations depends on access to not only quality habitat, but stable habitat. And the bulk of their breeding populations in Nova Scotia are dispersed across forest, working forest landscapes. There would be no way to protect enough forest to conserve these species uh, by doing that alone. So it's really essential um, to be working on breeding breeding habitat conservation in the working forests uh, in order to recover these uh, species at risk. So these are the five focal species um, and um, they're foraging habitats because food is always an important part of everybody's life. Um, so um, four of them are aerial insectivores. The first at the top is the common nighthawk. It's the largest species. It's primar primarily uh, active in dawn and, at dawn and dusks, and it captures flying insects and eats them on the wing. Um, the two flycatchers shown on the middle row are the Eastern Wood Peewee and Olive-Sided Flycatcher. They are both what are called sallying flycatchers, which means they sit on a perch watching for um, an insect of interest to fly by. When they see one, they fly out, grab it, and then either come back to the same perch or a different perch whack it to kill it, maybe pull off the wings and legs and then eat it. Um, but for these two species, they, they, uh, they live in different habitats and in different parts of the forest, one being in a more exposed area and one being within the canopy. The Canada warbler on the bottom is also an aerial insectivore, but it's mostly catching flying insects within the shrub layer uh, of wet forests. 
and the rusty blackbird um, is not an aerial insectivore, but um, it does eat uh, large aquatic insects that it picks out of shallow water or mud. So uh, you've probably all heard about the aerial insect decline and the, the windshield effect that we're not getting bugs on our windshield anymore. So this, the decline of insects is, is real and uh, it is definitely affecting uh, a lot of our species, including these. Uh, so four of these species shown on the bottom row are neotropical migrant, migrants, which means they migrate to the neotropics, that's Central or South America for the winter. Uh, all four of these species actually migrate all the way to South America to spend the winter. So they have a very long migration distance, uh, which adds to uh, the threats that they face during migration. Um, and the rusty blackbird is a temperate migrant. So um, it leaves Nova Scotia and spends the winter in um, the Southern US. Um, even though it's a temperate migrant, it has actually suffered the largest, largest declines of all five of the species. So these are population trends for these five species for Nova Scotia based on the breeding bird survey data, which is the, the main data source for population trends for land birds. And you can see the in blue is the downward trend and the lines around that are uh, confidence intervals. So you can see that, um, you know, that there's, there's a bit of, a bit of uh, noise around that signal. Um, and, you know, we've got declines um, and the, the, some of these are considered to be leveling off a little bit, um, which, which uh, may uh, influence their, their uh, SARA status. So currently, um, the five species are um, all listed under the Species at Risk Act, um, either as special concerned or threatened. Uh, Nova Scotia has um, the Eastern Wood Peewee listed as vulnerable, which is the lowest category. Common Nighthawk and Olive-Sided Flycatcher as threatened, which is like the next level up. And the Canada Warbler and Rusty Blackbird as endangered, which is the, the highest level of living species at risk. Um, Kosiwik, um, uh, has a, a slightly different um, stat has a slightly different status. So the way it works is the COSIWIC prepares a status report and recommends listing and uh, listing at a particular level. And so um, these are reviewed from time to time. And um, the olive-sided flycatcher was previously threatened by COSIWIC, and now it's con it's recommending special concern. But they're still considered. Um, species at risk. The same, same is true for the Canada warbler. So I think it's worth uh, spending a moment thinking about the fact that um, virtually all birds and their nests in Nova Scotia are protected by law unless they are um, non-native species. Um, and this is under the Canada's Migratory Bird Convention Act. It provides legal protection of the birds, their nests, their eggs and their nestlings from destruction, whether it's on purpose or accidental. Um, and uh, even though it's called a Migratory Bird Convention Act, it really does apply to all species, whether they're migratory or resident, if, as long as they are native, with a few minor exceptions that are then covered by provincial regulations. So you might think that, well, maybe I should be searching for nests before I harvest a, a stand. Um, well, that's not what uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada recommends um, for various reasons. Um, first of all, it's very, you're very unlikely to find a nest if it's there. They're very hard to find. Birds do a really good job at hiding their nests. And by walking through the habitat, you have a high risk of disturbing the nest, even if you don't find it. And if you do disturb it, um, you, may, you know, it may, it may be that the eggs are destroyed or the, the, the adults may abandon the nest. Um, the only exception to that would be cavity nesters. So for example, 
um, looking for the nests of woodpeckers, ducks, and nuthatches, which nest in cavities, um, is a reasonable thing to do. And I, th I think, you know, when you're doing a pretreatment assessment, I think that's one of the things that one's looking for are uh, cavity trees. Um, so they, ECCC uh, suggests that you should uh, consult the nesting calendars when uh, planning activities. So this, this is all on their website, you can look it up, um, but I've just copied out um, the nesting calendar for the regions called C2 and C3. And those are C, C2 is Southwest Nova Scotia and C3 is the rest of Nova Scotia. Um, so, um, and, and so this is like all of the birds that are found in this region. Um, these are the, the general nesting dates. And so you can see um, the darker the color, the, uh, the more species are nesting during that period. So the gray, there's nobody nesting. The red, um, uh, over 61% of the birds, of the species that occur there are nesting. So you can use this to determine when, would, when is the most sensitive time in terms of harvesting sites uh, if you wanted to avoid disturbing nests. Um, and you can also, the website also allows you to focus in on particular species and particular um, um, eco districts. So, um, so this shows you here at the bottom, um, uh, the five uh, species of interest and their nesting calendars in a specific eco district, which is Sheet Harbor. So that's where the Otter Ponds demonstration forest would fall. Um, so that shows you that common night hawks will be, will, should already have started nesting. Uh, all of sided flycatchers um, in a couple of days, uh, eastern peewee, eastern wood peewee a little bit later, Canada warbler um, already, and um, rusty blackbird, because it's only spending the winter in the US, it's coming back much sooner like all of the other blackbirds do, the grackles and the red-winged blackbirds. Um, and so, and, um, you know, it's, it, it's, its breeding season is shifted very far to an earlier part of the breeding season than the other species. And you can also see that um, the time they, they tend to end uh, their nests, like they don't have nests, active nests anymore, is, is different for each species. So, um, Eastern wood pee we was one of the longest is one of the longest uh, that have that will be nesting into the summer and in fact last summer we found them singing um, even uh, at the beginning of September like all the way through August. Okay, so paying attention to uh, when birds are nesting is um, is one of the strategies. So in, in summary, to develop, to prevent harming migratory birds, nests and eggs, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, recommend that you understand that migratory birds are legally protected, um, that you consult the nesting calendars when planning activities, um, and um, do what you can to determine the risk, risk of encountering eggs or nests on a case-by-case -case basis. So the best way to uh, determine whether there's likely uh, nesting birds at a site is to conduct surveys of singing territorial males, going out there early enough in the morning that, that you catch them singing. Um, and this will give you a list of the species that are likely nesting in the stand. That's, that's the recommended way to determine whether what, what species are likely to be impacted if you harvest a particular stand. And then lastly, to develop and implement preventative and mitigation measures, such as beneficial management practices. So beneficial management practices, or BMPs for short, are practices that are aimed to reduce risk and avoid harm to a target, for example, a species at risk, while carrying out activities like uh, harvesting or other silvicultural practices, or um, perhaps you're the Nova Scotia power and you're clearing power lines. 
Um, so BMPs can help landowners and forestry operators integrate the maintenance or creation of key habitat features for successful breeding of a species at risk into the management and planning of forestry operations. So these are two examples of BMPs that have been produced for these species at risk uh, in other uh, areas. Uh, and these, are, these BMPs are focused on forestry. So um, over on the right uh, is the um, guidelines for managing rusty blackbird habitat in New York and Northern New England. And uh, in the middle is the guidelines for managing Canada warbler habitat in the Atlantic Northern Forest of Canada. Um, so the, the rusty blackbird plan was developed for obviously a different region but there are probably enough similarities to the habitat that they use here that a lot of the features, uh, the BMP recommendations would apply. And for the Canada Warbler, um, most of the uh, recommendations, um, well, essentially all of the recommendations are based uh, on um, um, Northern New England um, and uh, assumed to apply to the Maritimes. Um, I think that they, probably are quite similar, use quite similar habitats in New Brunswick, but in Nova Scotia, they seem to be much more restricted to wet forest than, to, than they are in the other areas. So using information in these published um, management guidelines and the literature, Katie McLean at CARP, Clean Annapolis River Project, in collaboration with the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute, has been working on a series of two page fact sheets for species at risk. Um, so I've been helping her with um, the fact sheets for these five species and they were finalized um, um, at the end of March uh, 2022. Um, and um, I have given Christy copies and I think she uh, said she would post them on, on the Otter Ponds website. Um, so basically these are fact sheets for SAR um, well, actually, there, there are two sets of fact sheets that, they're, that uh, they're working on. One is for forestry and one is for agriculture. Um, so these are for forestry and they're based on literature review and you know, other uh, guidelines that have been produced. Um, and, uh, but they haven't been tested in Nova Scotia. So that's what we're trying to do. So, this current project aims to develop operational guidelines. You know, what, what we have in these fact sheets is sort of a list of recommendations, but it doesn't really say how you would go about doing something, how would you would apply it. So we're trying to develop operational guidelines that you could use in forestry operations, um, starting as a starting point using these draft BMPs. The development is being done in collaboration with partners. And so we're primarily working uh, on Crown lands. Um, and so we're drafting operational guidelines, testing the BMPs, and then we'll be revising the guidelines based on the results we get. So our partners include um, the Wildlife Division at Nova Scotia Provincial Government, the um, CWS um, in the, for the federal government, um, three Crown Lease Forest, ma forest Managers, the Medway Community Forest Co-op, West Four, and Port Hawkesbury Paper. And our main NGO partners are the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute and the Clean Annapolis River Project. And um, um, have had uh, some conversations with private woodlot owners. It would be nice to start um, trying some of these on private lands, um, but we haven't uh, gotten to that point yet. So there are BMPs that would be common to all five species, um, things like avoiding harvesting or so any other silvicultural practices um, when uh, during the bird's breeding season. And as I showed you before, the dates would, would be different for each species and to avoid or limit the use of pesticides and herbicides um, because these are going to negatively impact uh, non-pest insect populations, which these birds rely on for their food. And it also affects, affects the vegetation, which then affects their food. 
Um, but you know, these this kind of a BMP is quite general and it really would benefit most species of forest birds. If you look at the species that are associated with wet forest, which is the all-sided flycatcher, Canada warbler, and rusty blackbird, um, there are um, draft BMPs in common um, because of their inhabiting a wet forest. So avoiding activities that may alter wetland hydrology. Um, so you could harvest on snow or frozen ground, um, but you could altogether avoid harvesting and road building in forested wetlands. And you could leave a buffer around wetlands or open areas if you have an upland site that's adjacent to a, a wet area. So now we're going to take a quick look at each of these species. Uh, and I have um, an example of their vocalizations, which I hope you will be able to hear. This is the olive sided flycatcher. The sexes look similar. The most notable feature is this sort of uh, olive gray vest that it wears. Um, it has quite, quite short legs, um, so you can, basically you can never see their legs when they're perched, and a rather large sort of triangular or squared off head. They don't have any wing bars, which uh, a lot of other flycatchers do. The male sings a really distinctive song, tip three beers. And both males and females give these distinctive pip, pip, pip calls. The song of the male travels a very long distance, um, depending on the habitat it's going through, um, 200 to 300 meters. Uh, you, can, you can hear it that far away. The habitat the bird uh, needs in Nova Scotia is primarily spruce forest. It uh, seems to prefer black spruce swamps and bogs, but you also find it on clear cut edges of mature red and black spruce stands. Um, their habitat tends to have a lot of tall snags as well as residual live trees um, in patches um, and, a, and a relatively open canopy um, and uh, often a flowering ericaceous shrub layer. And I think that's really important because the bees are coming to the flowering shrubs and the birds are eating the bees. Um, they are, as I mentioned, a salian insectivore. And you can see this, this uh, um, male here has uh, an insect in his bill. They are uh, highly territorial. They have high site fidelity, but their territories are quite large, at least 20 hectares in size. Um, and they tend to sing from a prominent perch, say from the top of a tree. They nest in uh, large spruce um, and uh, in, in areas where there's um, a lot of dense foliage. These are examples of two nests. Uh, so for the olive-sided flycatcher, the draft BMPs include leaving a tree buffer of 50 meters in locations where there's red or black spruce surrounding a wetland. Um, using uneven age forest management so that you end up with clumps of tall trees standing in cutover areas. Um, they, they really seem to like that. Um, leaving the clumps of tall conifers when harvesting conifer stands can, uh, is a good idea because they can use these as perch sites. And um, because the snags are so important, they need to keep moving around within their territory going to different perches to try to find insect prey. So it's recommended that um, leaving all snags that do not pose a safety threat. The Canada warbler is a small songbird. Um, you hear it more often than you see it. Um, both the male and the female have a yellow breast and a, black, a gray back, but the male is just much more brightly color colored. Um, the black necklace on the front of the male is very distinctive. And um, only the male sings, and it sounds like this. So it's a song that's very complicated, and you don't have really hardly any repetition of the same note. So these are different notes within the song. 
And the only place you see any repetition is right in the center of the song there. Uh, most of the time you don't even see that in their songs. So that kind of separates them for, from um, a lot of the other warbler species. There are often 15 or more warbler species in a particular area if you, if you go out looking, looking for birds. Um, Canada warblers um, nest in, uh, on the ground. So over on the lower left, you can see a female on her nest. So the nest would be placed in a place like this, in some sort of a mossy hummock. Um, they, they seem to prefer in Nova Scotia mixed wood swamps with a semi-open tree canopy. So you have emergent trees, which the males can use for dis territorial display. And you have um, tall shrubs that are lots of, lots of tall shrub between two and five meters tall um, to provide cover and foraging. Uh, space, and then often a lot of cinnamon fern, and basically a very very messy site. So one of the one of the BMPs is to to leave is to make sure that that you don't clean up a site too much uh, if it is harvested. They have uh, their territory is only about a hectare, which is more typical for a songbird. Uh, and again, high site fidelity. The males are um, coming back to the same place year after year. Females as well. Um, and uh, so they, they have a lot of different requirements in their habitat. So the draft BMPs for this species are quite complicated. Um, they recommend uneven, mage, un, uneven, manage, sorry, uneven age management systems where you have at least three well-defined age classes, um, minimizing the amount of edge when you're harvesting a block because that um, they are sensitive to edge, uh, maintaining a mixture of hardwoods and softwoods, both at the stand and landscape level, limiting hardwood, hardwood herbicide use, because if you herbicide the shrub layer, then you're destroying the habitat, the, the birds cannot use it. Um, and then retaining uh, emergent trees for uh, singing visual and, sing and visual display centers. Um, they've actually figured out how many trees you should leave, about 12 per hectare, and that these trees should reach about three meters or more above the subcanopy and should be, they could be either dispersed or grouped in clumps uh, of a few trees that are separated by about 4.5 meters. So this is from detailed studies that were done um, uh, in Canada warbler nest areas in, in New Hampshire. Um, minimizing compaction of the soil and minimizing the removal of ground vegetation, moss cover, down woody material, stumps, hummocks, and root ma masses of ferns and trees um, to preserve their complicated forest floor habitat. Minimizing travel within the blocks, um, maximizing the trail spacings and reaching, um, and leaving the treetops and limbs on site to enhance the woody debris and forest floor structure. The rusty blackbird um, is all black. The male is a glossy black. The female is a charcoal gray. Um, they have a pale eye. Um, they look somewhat like a grackle, which is a much more common species, a, a, a common grackle. But their bill is much thinner. Their tail is shorter. And they're, they have a plumper appearance. Um, they have blackbird-like calls, um, but their songs are quite distinctive. They sound kind of like a opening a rusty gate. Sorry about that. I don't know if you could pick that out, but one of the songs is lower pitched than the other one. Um, and this seems to be uh, very common for a given male to have songs of these two pitches. But the beginning part of the song can be quite distinctive uh, to an individual. Rusty blackbirds need um, conifer dominated and mixed forest in low slope landscapes where you have um, multiple wetlands and streams. Um, so areas with beaver ponds, uh, stream and lake edges, if, if those are very, very shallow. In other words, um, you know, if you have a lake where you have a, a steep drop off from the vegetation to the to the bottom of the lake, then they're not going to be able to use it. So it has to be just a very low 
um, gently sloping um, water's edge. They too have high site fidelity, um, like the allocited flycatcher, they have a very large home range. Um, and they are moving around a very large area to find um, wetlands in order to forage. They're feeding on aquatic invertebrates. And as I mentioned earlier, they're, they're nesting uh, much earlier than the other species because they're arriving earlier. And they, um, they build their nest in clumps of young or stunted conifers. So these could be uh, like a, in a clear cut, um, but primarily they nest close to or over water. So sort of the natural situation would be stunted conifers in wetlands. And um, the upper two pictures here are um, nest, nest sites for rusty blackbird in different parts of Nova Scotia. And this is a, um, a, a beaver pond uh, that had a pair of rusty blackbirds. For the rusty blackbird, the draft BMPs include leaving a treed buffer around all wetlands, no matter how small, and all streams, um, because these are all um, potentially uh, important sites for foraging. And to maintain, uh, retain, uh, and during harvest, retain mature dead and live trees that are dispersed in, and in clumps for perch sites. They don't need a huge amount of cover, but um, they do need uh, uh, scattered tall trees. Um, they come back to the same spot to nest year after year. So if you know a bird is nesting there, you should try to, to sort of make that a tiny little protected area and not harvest it. <clears throat> you can remove 50% um, of the overstory in mature, mature shade tolerant, intolerant uh, softwood stands um, uh, if they have regeneration. Um, and you can also um, plant softwood species um, to, um, to, to create uh, nesting habitat. Although this has not been tested in Nova Scotia. The common nighthawk um, is, um, as I said before, active at dawn and dusk. They, you will hear them um, calling overhead. Oops. And uh, the male also has another sound that it makes. Um, it's called a boom. Um, and it's, it makes the sound as the wind rushes through its wings when it's doing a dive. And that's an indication that the birds are breeding very close to that site. It's, that's a, a territorial, breeding territory display. So it, these are quite distinctive birds. They're large. They have long pointed wings with a white patch going across their their outer, the outer part of their wings. Um, and they also have a, a throat patch here. If you're lucky enough to see it, you can tell if it's a male or a female. The females are beige. The males have a white throat. Um, so again, it's an aerial insectivore feeding on the wing, foraging at dawn and dusk over areas where there's abundant flying insects. So for the most part, rivers, wetlands, lakes, but they nest in open habitats and right on the ground in gravel types, gravelly types of uh, substrate. So that could include, <clears throat> could include clear cuts, burns, rock barrens, um, open fields, open woodland, gravel pits. And they used to nest on roofs when there were a lot of gra gravel roofs around. Um, in the daytime, um, they're generally not active, but roosting on a horizontal branch or on a large diameter log. Um, and it's also good to have some sparse tree or shrub cover to provide shade for the nest and the young and the incubating female. They have large home ranges. Um, it hasn't been studied in Nova Scotia, but uh, I suspect um, they're flying at least a kilometer um, or they could be flying at least a kilometer to, from their nesting site to their uh, foraging areas, but their territory is um, much smaller. So if you hear a boom, then you, you know that you're within 200 meters of um, um, the territory center or nest site. They lay eggs right on the ground, as you can see in the bottom middle photo, um, just a little bit of a scrape. And so foraging habitat, 
Um, and uh, the middle picture shows nesting habitat in a, um, a barrens, a rock barrens area. And um, they can also nest in clear cuts. So BMPs for the species include um, avoid driving on gravel areas or through clear cuts during the nesting season. Um, if there's a natural disturbance event like um, a windstorm to leave at least a, qu a quarter of the area unsalvaged. When harvesting to retain uh, dead and imminently declining trees um, at the rate of at least 12 per hectare and half of these with a relatively large DBH of 25 centimeters. And then these would become, these would provide some complexity to the habitat and allow the birds to roost on them in the daytime. Um, if you know that a bird is breeding at a site, then leave it, leave, you should leave a buffer around it um, until it finishes nesting. Um, maintaining small openings and immersion tall trees in closed canopy forests may uh, help provide uh, habitat for them. That's something I'm interested in testing and creating suitable condition, nesting conditions by leaving, um, you know, leaving areas of, of uh, gravel uh, roads deactivated, turnarounds and stuff like that alone during the breeding season. The eastern wood peewee um, is a flycatcher where the males and females look similar. The males, only the males sing, and there are two songs that you hear most of the time. A pee a wee and a wee you. And you, you may hear them alternating those two songs. It has another song, but it, you hear it more often at dawn. Um, so it has, um, in contrast to the olive sided flycatcher, it has a light, it is light underneath uh, rather than having that vest. Um, and it has wing bars. These are uh, quite noticeable when you're looking at them through binoculars um, and yellow at the base of the bill. And overall, a more slender bird with a longer tail and longer legs. You can actually see its legs. The peewee um, captures insects from a, an exposed perch, but this time it's under the canopy. So uh, for example, if you look at the picture on the lower right, you'll see that there are these, these uh, white pine have a lot of sort of dead side branches. Uh, these are great perches for the bird. Um, so um, this kind of habitat uh, seems to be good for the birds in Nova Scotia. Um, they seem to be um, more of a mixed wood species here than in other areas where they've been studied. Um, they have a territory that, you know, is around three hectares in size. They build an open cup nest. And you can see a, a bird at the nest in the upper right. Um, and um, primarily they're using mature Acadian upland forest stands. Um, and so a multi-layered canopy with lots of small gaps. Um, and you know, you may find them more abundant near rivers and lakes and wetlands, but they're really not, they're not a not really a riparian species in Nova Scotia, and they're really not a wetland species either. So more of an upland species. Um, draft BNPs include maintaining large mature trees greater than 30 centimeters in DBH in deciduous forests and even larger, 35 centimeters DBH in coniferous and mixed wood forests, um, main, maintaining um, a certain basal area, 22 meters square per hectare, um, and supporting the development of an uneven age stand structure. So um, I think that the, the new SGEM guidelines for uh, ecological forestry will in, in the long run end up benefiting the species. I think it will, it will create forests that have um, much more forest that has the kind of, kind of habitat that it's looking for. So um, you can make, create um, canopy gaps of variable sizes. Um, it's important to return, retain mature trees. Um, live trees for nesting, dead trees for foraging. 
and um, maintaining mature Acadian forests um, um, it, near wet areas may, may help provide the insects that the birds are actually uh, eating. And also creating large tracts of older or mid, middle aged forests with larger basal areas and small canopy gaps. So for our project, um, we, I, I'll tell you a little bit about the methodology we've been using. Um, so we, in order to select our BMP test sites, um, we started off with maps of approved harvest blocks that were provided by our forestry partners. Then we did a mapping exercise where we overlaid the harvest block maps with known SAR occurrences. Uh, for these five species and SAR habitat models that have been produced by my students in the past. Uh, and then we also considered, we looked at the forest inventory data to look at forest attributes. Um, then we did SAR surveys. We targeted the most promising blocks and parts of the blocks to survey. Um, we um, also used uh, recorders, ARUs, um, to help us find more birds. We provided uh, our list of occurrences to forestry partners. So basically here's a list of the birds that we found on or adjacent to your sites. And they sent back a list of the sites uh, that, had, that we had sent them with SAR uh, that were in a, or adjacent to the block that they actually planned to harvest this year. So we, we ended up surveying so many sites um, but in the end, um, a lot of them aren't actually gonna be harvested this year. So last summer, we located the target species at risk through field surveys. We used um, playback if we didn't, if it looked like it might be suitable habitat, but we didn't um, hear the bird or see the bird um, right away, we would use playback. Birds will respond to playback of their songs and calls as if it were an intruder. So they will usually then make themselves known, basically saying, you know, I'm here, <laughs> this is my territory. Uh, and so we did this at the list of harvestable blocks provided by partners. Um, um, then we used autonomous recording units. And this is a picture of one of those the types of the audio moth. Um, you, can, you can just attach it to a tree, you program it to record, we program them to turn on an hour before sunrise and record for 10 minutes every other 10 minutes until about four hours after sunrise and then turn on again 40 minutes before sunset um, and then go for 40 minutes after sunset to, so that we could pick up birds that were more active in the evenings. Um, we also documented the forest ecosystem classification vegetation type at each site. And overall, we surveyed over 70 harvest blocks across Nova Scotia. I'll show you a map in a moment where those were. And this summer, we are revisiting the blocks that are being harvested uh, between um, the end of the summer and next March. We're mapping the territories of the species at risk on those blocks or adjacent to the blocks. And we're also uh, deploying um, the ARUs to document uh, the presence of the the birds at these sites and uh, some, some of the other sites that we surveyed last year that aren't going to be harvested that we can use as control sites. And uh, we're also um, um, using, starting to use drone image maps. Um, and for at least a, a few sites, we'll, we're aiming to get before and after harvest um, drone images uh, for the sites to document um, how the BMP was uh, was actually applied. Um, and I think, yeah, here's the map of the sites that we surveyed last summer. So you can see there's a cluster of sites in southwest Nova Scotia, um, a, a few um, in sort of central and eastern mainland, but then a lot of sites in Cape Breton as well. And so our, again, our forestry partners were the Medway Community Forest Co-op. So their sites can you see my, uh, I, I'm assuming you can see my cursor, but anyway, they're in, um, in Southwest Nova Scotia, uh, West Four, um, and slightly to the east of those and, and south. 
um, and the um, PHP, Port Hawkesbury paper blocks. There were some that we surveyed in central eastern Nova Scotia, but mostly they were in Cape Breton. Um, all the, the colored uh, polygons are showing you where those sites were, were provided to us and the, um, the ARUs are showing generally the ones that we actually did get to visit. Um, so we have um, 15, about 15 sites that have been selected for BMP application um, in this year. Uh, we have eight sites uh, in Cape Breton, um, fortunately all in a relatively more accessible part of Cape Breton. Um, so eight sites uh, that are being harvested by Port Hawkesbury paper. Um, we have one site, uh, it's a relatively large site um, that is being harvested by Westfor. And we have six sites that we're looking at in the med in, uh, that is that are being um, that we have harvest plans for uh, for the Medway Community Forest Co-op. Um, this is a short summary of um, what we found um, last year at those harvest blocks. So um, we have we found Canada warblers at four, common nighthawks at two, eastern wood peewees at two. All of sighted flycatchers at 11 and rusty blackbird at one. But these numbers are minimums um, based on sort of the low intensity extensive surveys that we did last summer and also birds that we picked up in ARU recordings. And uh, so now we're doing more detailed surveys. So we expect to find a few additional SAR on these blocks. Um, and um, so what we're doing now. Um, my students are out in the field looking, uh, trying to map the territories of the birds so that we know exactly what part of the blocks they're using. So the application of the BMPs is going to focus on the specific area of the block that the birds are using rather than the whole block. Um, and the BMPs will be, be any particular BMP application. In other words, the, you know, what exactly will be done will be specific to that block and the type of SAR that's present. And uh, in some cases, the BMP may simply be a buffer on the edge of a block. Um, for example, if there was a SAR uh, just using the wetland adjacent to the block, then um, you know, what we need is a, a buffer um, so that we don't have um, a cut all the way up to the wetland. And one, one thing I noticed uh, doing the field surveys last summer was that, uh, and also looking, looking at things on, in satellite imagery, is that most of the harvest block outlines avoided um, obvious wetlands, um, uh, but there still are sites that do have SAR within them that um, are wet forest. So here's an example of a site that has been already harvested. Um, it, so the little, the little cir circles with houses in them are locations of ARUs. And the yellow is the outline of the block. This is the, basically the, the green is basically the um, satellite imagery. And then um, overlaid that is in blue. Um, in blue is the um, wet areas uh, within um, 10 centimeters of the surface. So the water, where the water table is within 10 centimeters of the surface and the green, the larger green area around it, the lighter green area around it is wet areas um, that have water table within um, a half a meter of the surface. Over on the right side is a drone image of that area after harvesting. And um, unfortunately you can't see a lot of detail there, but you may be able to see the harvest trails, the lighter areas running through that. Um, and um, so basically what we did is to, um, this, is, this 
the area you in the upper left corner is the one that had picked up all of sighted flycatcher and rusty blackbird, um, probably using this wetland uh, to the north of it. Um, so we designed a buffer. We buffered that the area around that wetland um, by um, modifying the harvest in along that line. And the drone images are courtesy of my husband, who uh, his hobby is flying drones and making drone maps, which is which is a pretty useful hobby for me. Um, we are also doing surveys and making ARU recordings at um, what we will consider control sites. These are other sites that are not being harvested during the project. And one such site uh, are these two sites in Otter Pond, a demonstration forest. Um, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be visiting these sites on, uh, on the field trip on Saturday. <clears throat> on the left is a site that had all the sighted flycatchers. Um, a little bit different from a lot of the sites you, you see them in. These are um, um, tall, mature red spruce, um, but they're kind of surrounded by a lot of open area. And actually what you can't see here is that there's a large wetland not too far away from there. So the bird is likely using the wetland as well as nesting in the trees. And on the right side, Canada warbler habitat. So very dense undergrowth, um, fairly scrubby um, trees, lots of shrubs and cinnamon fern um, and um, you know a, a lot of spruce and fir. And um, so those birds were quite obvious when we visited the site last July, July 10th with Christy. And um, when I was going through the ARU recordings, we also found common nighthawks um, in the recordings at both ARUs. So I think, I think it was just, probably the same pair that was flying around. These, these two sites are only about 250 meters apart. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, thank our partners in the project, our funders, and my field assistants for trudging through um, the swamps and um, dense forest. Um, and this slide, uh, is a call for questions and also a reminder to tell you that I'm going to be giving another webinar in three weeks um, in association with the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute. And I'll pro be providing some more information there from, from um, additional information that wasn't in this webinar that is focused on Eastern Wood Peewee because we did a detailed habitat study of Eastern Wood Peewee in Southwest Nova Scotia last summer and also more about um, the common nighthawk uh, uh, vocal patterns that we found in the ARUs. Awesome, thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, does anyone have any questions? You can uh, type them in the chat or uh, there's a raise your hand option. Let me. Let's see. Uh, all right, we have one in the chat uh, from Lauren Arts. Thank you for the interesting talk. What suggestions uh, do you have for someone who wants to implement the BMPs for as many SAR as they can in one area? Does it get complicated to try to achieve everything? Well, I think the approach to take or my suggestion would be to find out what SAR are there and then to do what's appropriate for each SAR. I don't, I don't think um, it makes a lot of sense to, to try to apply all of these in one area if you don't actually have the SAR there, for example. Um, and some of them may be somewhat contradictory to each other. All right. I see Dan has his hand up. Let's see, are you right. able to unmute there, Dan? Yeah. Perfect. Can I go with Christy? Mm -hmm. Cindy, thank you. Great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'm looking forward to the uh, field trip on Saturday. I'm going to be there, so that's going to be great. Um, my question is, uh, can you say, well, when you during your brief, I, um, you know, it was kind of uh, um, 
you know, thinking about, you know, the predominant uh, forestry uh, uh, type in Nova Scotia's clear cutting and all of these BMPs really, you know, are not reflected in uh, the predominant forestry in Nova Scotia. That's kind of depressing. Maybe some changes coming in the future. But my question is, uh, what are the pressures on these species like in their winter habitat? Uh, well, they are under a lot of pressure in the winter habitat. The birds that are going all the way to South America um, have had a lot of habitat loss there. Um, a lot of a lot of conversion of forests to um, agriculture and, and cocaine coca plantations and other things. Um, so you know there are people working to you know to try to do things like um, shade shade coffee plantations uh, seem to be beneficial to a lot of birds, including say the Canada warbler. So. If, if your question is, um, is, every, is everything that's happening to them happening on the breeding ground? Um, no, um, we don't think it is, um, but uh, the breeding ground is very important. And so, and it's something that we have an easier time to do something about rather than um, affecting how, what's going on in Bolivia, for example. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that basically was my question. And I just kind of assume that uh, where these birds are breeding is an environment that they're more sensitive to changes than they might be in other habitats. But uh, yeah, they're under environmental pressure in their entire range. So bad news. Glad mm -hmm. you're studying it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and also with, with climate change, um, a lot of the uh, we expect that climate change is going to cause a drying out in general of wetlands and uh, wet forest. So that's going to reduce the amount of habitat that way. Um, and also the insect decline has reduced their food supply. So, um, you know, making sure that they have the habitat they need um, is basically the easiest thing that we can do. Thank you. And Mark Pulsifer had a comment. Let me just unmute. Are you able to unmute now, Mark? Unmute. How's that? Can you hear me? Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stacer. I uh, really enjoyed that. I've been looking forward to this talk from, I think, the first time that it was advertised and then and then was postponed. So, so thank you very much for doing this. Um, the comment I wanted to make was, I, I guess, one in which I'm particularly interested in, in the work that you're doing because um, I was involved as a biologist and then a manager working for natural resources for decades, and then was part of the team putting together the SGEM, the Silviculture Guide for the Ecological Matrix. And, and now I'm retired, but consulting and training department staff and industry staff on ecological forestry. So, so this is really, really, germane to the types of things that I'm doing now. And I'm so pleased to see your, your draft best management practices because there's a number of the things in there that you're mentioning that, that I think are, are already incorporated into, into the SGEM, into the silviculture practices, particularly around irregular shelter woods. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was, it's really gratifying. I, I, I was doing a, a session this afternoon, in fact, and I, I saw an Eastern wood pea. We heard it singing in, in amongst a gap of regular shelter wood. And so, you know, we had that, that multiple under, tier understory, the relatively open overstory, still lots of basal area left behind, all kinds of coarse wood and material and, and structure on the forest floor. And, and here amongst the middle of all that was a, was a male singing, you know, calling. So, so that part was great. Um, a couple of times you made references to, to not harvesting in, in, in uh, forested or treed wetlands. And again, that's something in the SGEM, harvesting in, in both the wet coniferous and wet deciduous forests is no longer permitted on crown land. No roading, no harvesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's gonna be a really positive thing um, with respect to the program and you know, respect to these species at risk. 
other things you're suggesting that the different levels of, of standing cavity trees and live trees, again, um, where some of the, the different guidelines with the SGM are a minimum of 20 trees per hectare live left, all standing cavity trees left that aren't of safety hazard left behind. Oh, there's basically, we're trying to promote that multi-aged multi and multi-layered forest that is gonna be important for a lot of things. So I don't, I'm not gonna belabor the point um, other than just to say that I'm really pleased to see the work you're doing. And I think that it's, it's going to complement um, the work that the department is doing with respect to trying to move down that path of ecological forestry. It's, you know, I wanna be able to take the information that you've given us tonight and what we'll hear again on Saturday with these best management practices. I would love to be able to implement that, you know, to propose those things to both private landowners and to crown staff and industry staff as, as, as a way to achieve the, um, the biodiversity goals, I guess that basically is particularly with the ecological matrix where biodiversity is supposed to be the, you know, the number one and primary um, forest value promoted. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so no real question other than just to say, thank you very much. And, and to let you know that, that I certainly is one, we really appreciate what you're doing here because it's, it's going to go a long way to helping us do what we need to do with respect to ecological forestry. So, and biodiversity conservation in the bigger picture. So thank you. Thank you very much for saying that. Um, yeah, I was very, very pleased when I saw that the SGM recommended not harvesting in forested wetlands or, or you know, wet forest types. Um, so how much, how much um, sphagnum do you have to have in a site to put it into that category? Um, well, I think that's where the FEC is going to come in and basically in terms of understanding what the, what the, the soils and the vegetation will tell you how much. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, I don't know if anybody, I guess Kevin Keyes would be the person to ask in the department as to just how much sphagnum it, it takes. Um, we at the time didn't didn't work out that level of detail. Basically, we came up with generic recommendations that it you know just shouldn't happen. Um, Kevin may have a better idea between Kevin and Peter Neely. They may have a better idea of of just exactly what the definition of of wet forest is going to be in in terms of what you know. One of the things that I was always concerned about and you know, it was just the, the whole delineation piece in general and whether or not you delineate hard to the border and you know yourself that a lot of those wetlands, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a graded border. I mean, basically there's a gradation from upland to, to wetland. And so, you know, certainly my recommendation is to different groups in, in, including the partners that you're, that you're stewarding with was that, you know, you should, I guess, basically, define what you think the boundaries probably is and then add another five meters outside of that you know just as just as a minimum and just don't even get yourself in that situation where you can even um unintentionally run into a problem you know just err on the side of caution and and give yourself that the benefit of of, um, of staying out of them completely because we did hear various comments well okay fine we can't harvest in them really we can't put a road through them can we reach into them and pull wood out. And, you know, my answer was consistently, no, you can't do anything inside them at all. And uh, I guess what's really gonna have to happen is at some point down the road, the department, and again, I can't speak for them because I don't, I no longer work for them, but uh, the department's obviously gonna have to just define exactly what the best management practices are and, and answer all those types of questions when it comes to, you know, wet forest types. And, because there's a lot of them out there. It, that's a, that's a, that is a significant withdrawal of, of potential wood fiber if you eliminate all your forested wet forested wet forested sites. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, another benefit um, of not harvesting forested wetlands is they they tend to sort of connect other connect with other forest or wetlands across the habitat and so provide a lot of connectivity for wildlife. Yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of um, harvesting guidelines, um, have you thought about um, like 
the spacing of trees, because I think the spacing of trees that are retained are really important for birds. Like you yes. can the same number of trees, but if they're evenly spaced, um, they won't provide the same habitat as they would if they were clumped. No, you're correct there. And, and keep in mind that when we talked about this in the beginning, particularly the committee that put together the guidelines in general for the SCHEM, we recognize that no one site can be everything to everything. And we understood that there is certain biodiversity that prefers um, dispersed trees, dispersed green tree retention. And there are certain, uh, there are certain forms of biodiversity that prefer clumped green tree retention. Mm -hmm. And so it's like everything else. You, you look at it at the stand level and you look at the landscape level to see just exactly what your objective should be. And so one of the things that was being proposed, and I think it's still on the table, is that within any particular irregular shelter wood, whether or not it's continuous cover or gap irregular shelter woods, um, that there be a mix of both dispersed retention and clumped retention, particularly clumped where you're gonna have a higher, higher proportion of trees likely uh, because of aspect and because of soil conditions to, to blow down. Mm -hmm. And so in those particular situations, even in addition to the wildlife clumps that are still going to be required in some of these silviculture treatments, uh, there's also going to be uh, clumping of, of even three, four, five trees in small patches just to hold each other up. So it increases the likelihood that the trees are going to survive um, at, at least last a couple of years so they don't, they don't blow down, which seems to be the industry threat worry right now that they don't appreciate the fundamental values of course wood material like biologists would mm -hmm. and so there's still a, a feeling amongst a lot of the forestry workers that once a tree blows down it's 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 wasted wood or lost wood so um do you know if there's any um sort of uh, strategy in within the guidelines to to try to increase diversity the basically the diversity of habitat, the diversity of trees within a site to like if a site is most mostly coniferous to to maybe retain the hardwoods in the site to in, uh, increase uh, mixed wood values. Right. I, I understand what you're saying. And I guess the, the big answer is yes, um, that there is recognition that that basically that biodiversity in general, not just birds, but biodiversity in general is tied to forest structure, a stand structure and, and vari variation within the stand. And so there woodlot owners, both certainly on the crown, um, leases, and even in private land will be encouraged to make sure that they maintain the biodiversity, the total variation within the site itself. And so that we're trying to recommend or trying to get people away from anything that might be construed as stand conversion or when you go in and do spacings or, or thinnings that you, you don't take out all your hardwood just because it doesn't happen to be the commercial species that you're looking for. Um, so I guess quick answer is yes. Okay, that's great to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, yeah, you're asking me the questions and uh, I, I could talk forever about it. So anyway, let's, let's, let's not. <laughs> so anyway, maybe Saturday, you and I can have a chat on Saturday about a lot of these things, so yeah. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Uh, we have a, a question from Holly. Uh, she says, great presentation. CHPTA, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Holly, that's the Coal Harbor Parks and Trails Association. Uh, they leave the habitat B unless cleaning up storm damage or in one area, um, uh, cleaning up storm damage or in one area of restoring an Acadian forest habitat. Uh, the question is, uh, what can we do to encourage these birds or other species at risk other than keeping people out? Mm. Um, well, in, in that particular area along the Shearwater Flyer Trail where we have um, a significant population of Canada warblers, um, one, thing, one thing I've noticed is that uh, there's a fair bit of cleaning, cleaning up along the trail. And uh, for example, there, there was a dead a large dead larch, um, not too close to the trail that was cut down, uh, I guess, because it was dead. Uh, but it used to be a, a, a tree that the Canada warbler that had a territory there would use. 
Um, and so um, I think it would be nice to, uh, before you clean up along the trail to make sure that, that you know, it's a definite hazard to people uh, because all of the mess along the trail is actually beneficial to the Canada Warbler. Uh, I know that there's also Eastern Wood Peewee along one of the other trails on the other side of Bissett Road, um, maybe more than one, a couple of birds. Um, and um, I think, you know, trying to encourage uh, um, small canopy gaps within the Acadian forest that you're, that you are restoring there would be a great idea. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I think that's it for the questions in the chat. Does anyone else have any questions? And if not, um, if any of you uh, haven't signed up for the, the field day on Saturday and still want to come, we do have still have a couple of spots left. Uh, if you email me by tomorrow morning, I'll get you on the list. Uh, and for everyone who's already signed up, we will see you on Saturday, bright and early. So I'll be showing you all of the different birds we can find and talking about their habitat associations. And I'm hoping that the foresters among you that are there will, will uh, uh, we could have a discussion about how a particular kind of treatment to a stand would, would perhaps encourage a particular species. Perfect. Thanks very much, everyone. All right. Thank you very much, Cindy. I'll see you on Saturday. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.